Did you go into this with a particular story that you wanted to tell? Truth. Well, that's, that's really the story that you would think you would go into this Virginia to tell, but in the end she's a very elusive creature, isn't she? And as you can see from that, epi that part of the episode tonight that you just played, as elusive as ever. You have two people talking about the same events, they're both in the room and we relied only on people who were in the room at any given time, telling completely different stories. So in the end, it's their story told through their words and up to your viewers to decide who they believe. We go back to the beginning in the first episode and when Kevin Rudd got the leadership before the 2007 election, were there particular tensions or compromises that were put in place at that time in your view that were always going to play out later? Well, as, as we know, this is two very different people and it is very interesting going back to that early period because I think that our minds have been clouded quite a lot by what came afterwards. So even mm. for us making the series, and I think it'll be the same for you, that revisiting that is going to come as quite a surprise. So yes, we know we had two very different people, but at that stage, most of the people around them, certainly those people that pushed them to tap Kim Beasley on the shoulder, thought that those different qualities, the different uh, constituencies they appeal to would work, that the yin and yang, as Bruce Hawker puts it, would actually would actually work. And in the course of the first episode, while the tensions are there, you can see where it was working. You can see how those two very different personalities actually produce something quite effective together. In a way, I guess I'm also asking whether Gillard's own leadership ambitions and even those of Bill Shorten's were always going to overwhelm the situation at some point. Well, that's certainly the view of some of her colleagues. One of the most arresting moments in the, uh, in the first episode is actually a discussion around that, whether or not there was what kind of agreement there was between them. So that's, that's already there. And Jenny Macklin has a very, um, a, a very strong view. She mm. felt that Julia Gillard was always, coming, was always coming through, and that's why she stepped aside. So look, let's hear now from um, Kevin Rudd, I guess on that point about the, uh, the so-called loyal deputy. Let's have a listen to a bit from the show. During his overseas trips, Julia Gillard was acting Prime Minister. The out of touch, out to lunch Liberal Party. And receiving praise for her efficiency. You never bothered putting uh, something you needed Prime Minister or sign off for into the PM's office uh, until you knew Julia was going to be uh, in the chair. So you were obviously travelling a great deal during this period. How much were you relying on Julia Gillard as your fill-in Prime Minister back home? A lot. Because what I wanted to happen longer term uh, was uh, for Julia to replace me uh, as Australia's first female Prime Minister. It sounds a little bit too perfect. There isn't a leader in the world who doesn't feel some irritation at their deputy doing a brilliant job in their absence. No. Perfectly relaxed. Perfectly relaxed. Uh, do you believe him, Sarah? I think as I said at the time, and I just realised I'm actually wearing my Kevin Rudd jacket, which yes. he <laughs> referred to as my Star Trek outfit, which I thought was a very strange way to um, begin a relationship during an interview. But anyway, Star Trek it goes. Um, do you believe them or not? And this question of truth and mendacity and memory and sincerity is, is to the fore throughout the series. Um, that's certainly the story that he's telling, whether or not he's misleading us, whether or not he doesn't remember or he's persuaded himself he felt that at the time. The layers of truth are for unpeeling, but um, I don't know is the answer. Mark Abib emerges in your documentary as a key figure. Tell us why. Well, Mark Abib, of course, played a huge role in Kevin Rudd's rise to power. Kevin Rudd couldn't have taken the leadership position without Mark Abib's support. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, Mark uh, was formerly in charge of the New South Wales Party in New South Wales, came out of the Graham Richardson, whatever it takes school, a very hard school, a machine school. This is one of the great debates around Kevin Rudd because he says that he was brutalised by factional politics in the Labour Party. But by the same token, and people talk about this in the episode tonight, he also understood perfectly the power grids within the Labour Party. He knew exactly what he had to do mm. to get the support to become leader because he wasn't an obvious choice. Not strictly an outsider, but still not an obvious choice with no factional godfather to see him through. So Mark Arbib was that man. And of course, Mark Arbib 
played a role in taking him to the top and played a decisive role in, ta in taking him down. Well, we're jumping ahead of um, this episode tonight, but we are in conversation about the whole thing and an enduring interpretation of the coup that, of course, Feld Rudd was that his senior cabinet ministers, if they'd done their job and called their leader to account earlier, if they'd had a bit of steel, all of this might have been averted. At the end of all the work that you've done, what view have you formed on that? Well, it, it's very hard to avoid that conclusion. I mean, one of the big questions we keep coming back to is, and again, perhaps one of the most reliable sources on this is Ken Henry, the head of Treasury, who doesn't have, um, doesn't have, he has skin in the game, but he doesn't have a view either way. V Julia Gillard versus mm. Kevin Rudd says, from his point of view and the point of view of all the people around him, there should have been a deeper quality conversation on the things that needed to change. And to see a lineup of cabinet ministers on the night that the leadership change happened say that they were taken by surprise really beggars belief, I think. So how did the protagonists then reflect on their actions now? Is there any expression of regret, any true and genuine introspection? There is some introspection and there's some very strong uh, lines at the beginning of episode three, which is the beginning of Julia Gillard's period in office, from some of the people closest to her who accept that the way the leadership change was, was pushed through damaged her, possibly fatally. So to that extent, yes, there is, there is a view and it's more powerful because it's expressed by those closest to her. Um, they say that she was, for example, damned from her first day in office. These are strong words mm. coming from her closest friends. And do one of those two Prime Ministers emerge as more credible to you? I'll leave that to you and to Michael and to the viewers because I am a feather for every wind that blows. I see one, I think, yes, that's the truth. I see the other, I think, yes, that's absolutely the right narrative. Uh, in the end, the power of this is in their own words. It's watching them and seeing what you think and I'd like you to let me know. I'm going to accuse you of ducking the question, Sarah Ferguson. I Accepted. know that's probably the first time you've been told that before. Very first time, but I don't <laughs> mind it from you. <laughs> nice to see you. Take care. Congratulations. Great show. Thank you.